Hey guys, this is Garth Holman, and um, I'm doing a, a recording here of, uh, well, for this post on Open Educational Resources. A um, couple things this, this post is about. I did an interview a couple weeks back with Matt Miller, who's the author of Ditch That Textbook, and everything that's happening in this post is a result of that. So I talked to some people in the area. Stephanie uh, DeMichael, who's up the street here in the Cleveland area, has created an um, open resource um, building your own open resource um, kind of ebook that can be downloaded on this page. And then what I'm doing is I got some questions from out of state. The particular group I'm going to work on today are from uh, Dallas, who's in Oklahoma. And he sent a bunch of questions for me to kind of go over. And so what I thought I might do is try to record this so that if these questions come up again and some of these things come up, um, it'll be in this post and recorded for future use. Um, there seems to be more interest in the online textbook and um, these open educational resources. So let me just talk briefly about that before we get rolling in case you're new to this topic. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is student-created educational resources. So this may be a step beyond the idea of an open educational resource. Um, if a teacher creates slideshows, puts them on the web, and they're hyperdocs or they're, um, you know, they create readings or, or whatever it may be. That is an open educational resource that can be found on the web and used for your class. So you build your content from open educational resources. Um, you are no longer using a textbook to guide that instruction. You create your own textbook through using resources. What I'm talking about is stuff that kids create in the classroom and then you build your educational resource year after year off what kids have already created. So what I'm going to be basically be talking about is... Um, the student created textbook that my students have done and really this has been a long time in progress so this is the actual book um, this was started I think back in 2008 I believe so maybe or 2007 I believe so we'll kind of look at that but this is pretty far end of the process so I'm going to try to explain how we got to um, multiple pages um, kid created all written work um, kid created documentary movies that they've built so these are all created by kids um, all the links are found by kids, podcasts by kids. Um, you know, there's some downloads, and we're going to see all kinds of different things being built in, thing links, et cetera, with the kids' dates of when they were kind of doing things. So I'm going to try to explain that by answering all these questions that Dallas sent forward. So I'm just going to kind of, I will link this document into the post itself, so you'll be able to click on any of these links. I'm not necessarily going to go to all of these. I'll talk about some of them, and we'll move from there. So overall, um, I'm going to start with Dallas's questions. He wanted to, he kind of, his questions kind of broke down into three areas, I thought, um, and then I ended up creating them into two. One was basically about the process, and then he had one about how you evaluate the work of the kids. So those are the kind of things I'm going to kind of talk about. Process probably is going to take the longest. The first thing I would say is I, I am a constructionist, so everything I do is based on the constructionist philosophy to education, that he who does the most work learns the most that kids create their own meaning of information, regardless of whether I provide detailed notes, they're going to construct their own meaning of that. So I kind of go to heart to that, where I'm a lot of inquiry-based learning, a lot of kids doing um, me establishing a framework, and them creating the content based on what they want. I think you might see this slide, or this video, and again, I'll click on a lot of these. We aren't going to watch them, we aren't going to see them, you can kind of watch them. But the kids basically go through and explain why we did the online textbook the way we did. So you might want to take a look at that to get the kids' perspective. But the process itself, and a lot of his questions were like, well, you know, how do you get there? What are you doing? Um, I think it's very important to think about these things. Um, the first weeks of school become extremely important in my classroom or, or any classroom that wants to do the kind of things we're talking about. When you want to give kids control and ownership of the learning, that has to start from the first day they walk into the room. A lot of classrooms, the control is in the teacher's hands. The teacher controls the daily agenda. They control everything about what's happening. They assign the readings. They pick this. They pick that. Control's ultimately in the hands of the teacher. And a lot of times kids feel like control and ownership of all learning is at the teacher's will. So what we're attempting to do throughout the beginning of the year is to flip that. We're trying to give kids control. That doesn't mean we don't guide. That doesn't mean we don't provide structure. Um, I provide a lot of structure in the beginning, and as we move through the first couple of uh, weeks, months, that structure begins to show up less and less. 
the overriding idea principle that needs to be accomplished is there. It's always there. But how that transpires and work changes slightly, and we'll see some of that as we go. A couple of things I would look at. One of the pro big projects we, we start the school year off with is um, this project about how, and again, this is back in 2011, this post, but you can see an example of what we do. We start a lot with what's seventh grade like, trying to get kids to understand what historians really do. We get them creating essential questions, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. I have about 750 of these documentaries of first person. This is the only one that I have permission from both parent and student to put up, so you can kind of watch it. It's a little bit older, but I think you'll get the gist of what kids are starting to do. The other thing you might want to look at, this kind of lays out um, how I run my first day. There's quite a bit here, kids' responses, kids' thinking to it, but maybe more importantly, there's a link to creating a culture that inspires. So after um, this post, which is probably the most read post I have um, on my website, which is really from 2011, um, in 2013, I tried to capture more of what goes on that first day. So the information we use, the slideshows we use, um, is all here. And then I took the 40-minute class and kind of combined it down to 11 minutes. So I spliced and cut. and So you can kind of get a feel for what day one is in my classroom. Um, I think that'll help you establish that from the very first moment the kids walk in my room, um, I am totally changing the perception of what school is. Um, we do Hudokan in the first week where we're outside doing perception versus reality. We're doing, um, really, it's all inquiry work the first couple of weeks. It's all inquiry. It's all getting kids to try to find answers, to search for answers, to work in groups. Um, and as you go, you, you'll read more, you can look more into this. You know, we get into these essential questions. This is a big part of our beginning of the year. Um, this, again, from 2011, I got a lot of posts that are older that I, you know, don't rewrite necessarily. But this was the 2011 year. So we spend we, uh, about a week and a half at the beginning of the year talking about questions that excite them. You know, you know, there's Wonderopolis online that you can look at that has questions. But I try to get the kids to start to create their own. And through a process of uh, kind of like a jigsaw activity, they create their own. Then we kind of narrow them down and things that school might be able to help them answer. Then we look at, well, what's my content? What am I required to teach by the state of Ohio? Um, and then from that, what questions do you guys have you come up with that you think are important questions you want to learn about? And so what we try to do is pick the questions that make sense for the content I have to teach, but it's all student driven. So, oh, um, these were the 24 questions or 25, I guess it is, that the kids came up with in 2011 that guided our entire year. So we always went back to these questions. You know, and if you look at them, they're questions they create. They're questions they find interest. And it is interesting to watch throughout the year kids say, oh, my gosh, that's part of the answer. Because they understand that essential questions don't have a final answer. Um, there are some assignments I'll show at the end of this or at least provide a link um, where we do um, – we use Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel to look at someone who spent their career trying to answer a question. And so we try to give them examples of the modern world, how people are doing this for a living. This is what they do. They think up a question and then try to solve that question their entire life. You know, we talk about medicine. We talk about a variety of things. So that whole first few weeks of school are all about giving kids control and ownership of learning. We do a lot with digital citizenship. We do a lot with working on the web. We do a lot with the Wayback Machine. We really want them to understand what digital citizenship means, what digital ethics are all about. That comes back into the, your, your student creative materials when they're not copywriting. They're not using um, licensed pictures. We try to get them to understand all of that. Then I guess you have to start thinking about if you're going to collect content for kids to use, you really have to do three things. You have to get an aggregation of all that content. you got to curate the content, and then you have to create something with it. Because I'm not doing all teacher-directed, um, everything we do is we collect all of our data using a common thing that the kids do. Now, this is my school website. This post is how many kids are in our History with Holman um, group and we've got 952 kids sharing information in Digo. If you're not familiar with Digo on Teachers for Tomorrow, um, you can go back to the website and click Digo or just watch a video. It's basically a way to analyze, highlight, um, you know, annotate, highlight, collect, organize information from the web. So if you're a person who likes to highlight in a book, 
And right in the margins, Deagle lets you do that on all the websites. So we teach the kids how to aggregate data, how to collect it, how to get it together. Then we also teach them how to curate that. How do you organize that data? Um, and what we do, and this is important to the overall online book, is we teach them blogging in the first three to weeks of school. They learn how to blog. We set up blogs for them. Um, we'll just pull up. I just picked three random kids from this year to kind of take a look at. Um, so you can see their blogs. Now, we use Weebly. You can use any blogging site you want. We use Libby. Weebly. I'm sorry. In this case, the first homepage is always about digital footprints. We talked about digital footprints, right? We talked about legacy and what is their legacy going to be. That's more of that idea of the online book. How are you going to leave a legacy for others to remember you? Um, so from the very beginning of school, they're learning that. We talk about leadership and what does it mean to pay it forward and how can you do small things that impact the world around you. I had mentioned the archive. This is probably a link to the Wayback Machine would be my guess, and it is. So the students begin to collect and, and in a sense, curate their own information. Um, and again, then they begin to build their own things. It says creation. That's the key to me. What do they create? So in this case, we were looking at a Black Death post done a couple of weeks ago. This was, what, three weeks ago. So a kid writes their thing, but then they created a My Map. Um, and so if you've never seen a My Map, that's a Google app for education. It works a lot like a Google Doc. But they can proceed to put information in and key information and basically trace events as they go and explain how the Silk Road impacted. So they're beginning to build their own content. This is important. You know, Dallas, you ask a lot of questions about this. Everything we do all year is about building your own content. In the end, the best stuff by the kids they pick to put on the online book. We don't dictate it. We don't decide. The kids all decide that information. But everything we do, and if you go back and we look, okay, so there's a mind map. I just picked a variety, these three kids that showed differences. So this one, they did their own podcast. This is an eight-minute long podcast where they have a discussion about inequality in the world today. Um, so each one, you know, and again, there's literally hundreds of these kids doing Vokies, kids doing s'mores, kids doing, you know, stop motion animation, kids doing... RSS stuff, but these are the basic ones that I happen to see quickly. So on this one, she did a basic thing link, but she's got information. She understands the process. Now she can build those as we go more and more. Now, a lot of these things you're seeing, they've learned how to do at the beginning of the year, and just all year, they are asked to create their own content. You might want to take a look at a couple blog posts. They're going to talk more about blogging with kids. I think that's a probably a great step. Um, you can kind of get a feel. There's a lot of posts on blogging, getting kids active in the blogging atmosphere. The other thing you have to keep in mind, that all of this is really about trust and engagement. Um, probably the underlying principle in what we're trying to do is we want to build trust from day one with our kids, and we want to build the idea that engagement and inquiry into content is what learning is about, applying the information they're learning somewhere else. Although I bought into Dan, put Dan Pink's book called Drive uh, well before I read Dan Pink's book, his ideas of autonomy, mastery, and purpose became really important to me. They gave us like a foundation. Those were the things I believed, but I never would have articulated them that way. So he gave me a structure to kind of hang my hat on. We try to provide our kids autonomy. We try to show mastery of content. And then we try to show purpose through the online book. You're engaging. You're leaving a legacy. You're providing others with information. And again, we have kids that have 150,000 hits on YouTube. They are impacting other people. So they see a purpose in their work. Uh, a friend of mine who's, uh, you know, um, who does a lot of ebooks with his kids and, and publishes a lot of ebooks says the phrase, you know, when they turn work in for me, it's good enough. When they turn it in for the world, it's something better. And I think that's relevant. Kids see an authentic audience in what we're talking about. Their blogs are public. We do not lock them down. They are public to the world right now. Um, that is with parental permission. Every parent signs permission to allow those blogs to be done. Yet everything you see, whether it be on the blog, whether it be a presentation they make, or whether it be something on the online book, first names are only used. We don't add last names at this point. And you can kind of look at this. Um, our lesson plans and ideas are in this presentation. This is probably one to take a look at. It kind of goes through um, universal design and how we design our lessons. I've briefly mentioned a few things about um, 
essential questions. I mentioned Digo and a lot of that stuff. There's the philosophical background in this presentation. Um, but as you get down here, we kind of talk about the constructionism, how, why we do what we do. Um, we'll come to this in a few minutes. But then you get into um, how we design our lessons and what they ultimately look like, the search engines we're using, the essential questions we use, how we collaborate with the kids. So there's a lot more going on that you can kind of take a look at at your own pace. I think what I'm doing is way over here in this inquiry research. Right? The learner is the research, right? Traditional classes, the teacher controls everything. That was that first thing I was kind of talking about. As I, where I am right now, which I didn't start here, so don't think you're going to start here necessarily. That's an overwhelming task. You know, if you can start, you're maybe more truck, uh, traditional, you go to a structure where you let kids do the creation, and then you start guiding that. Um, and then the teacher is giving up control. The more control you give up is probably, I don't even know if I'm here really, I'm probably here. I'm probably more in the learner-directed inquiry um, because it's not a free-for-all. The kids don't come in and say, I want to learn about this today. There is guidance or topics. Now, our topics aren't really selected by me. They're selected by the state, but I kind of filter through those. The essential questions are the kids, um, but you, you kind of see that. This is kind of a little visual I think will help you, you see where we're going. A lot of people have asked the question, where should this online textbook be? You know, is it Wikispaces? Is it something else? Um, my first answer is we started, and I think it's worth seeing, we started ours in Wikibooks. And so this was published, I don't even know when, um, a long time ago. And this is what we had. So uh, it says it was modified in 2012, but I think we started in 2007 or something. It's pretty old. But if you go into this, and again, I haven't seen these pages in a long time, this is the way the online book started. It was just written work. Ultimately, to make a long story short, we lost the password to this, and we decided it was too hard and too complicated. So we did go to Wikispaces. Wikispaces is relatively easy to use. Um, it allows kids. I call this the kids' playground. It's their playground. It's a place for them to do work. Um, I control it with the idea of membership. I know that was a question you asked. But one of the things that I think is important is it's I control, but I don't lock them from doing what they want to do. And if I go back, I think I, I, I linked on here. Um, this is a good example. This is how the page we were just looking at started. So I built this page on May 20th, 2009, and that's what it looked like. You can go through every revision. So on June 1st, 2009, this is what it looked like. And on June 1st, this is what it looked like. And you can go through every version of the whole thing until you get to the, the newest version. There's only 115 changes in this. If we just go back to the newest version, which was done by this kid. Oh, we'll just, uh, oh, shoot, I clicked the wrong thing. No, let's do that. We'll see what he changed. Anything in red, he changed, so he just made a couple. He's making some editorial changes in it. But you can see the page now. I did none of this, really. The kids build this. I don't lock out what they do. Once they're a member, they have free reign. I have not seen any um, unethical behavior. There's not been swear words. There's not been any of that. The kids, for the most part, um, I shouldn't even say for the most part, the kids have not done anything inappropriate in this online book. Um, there was a kid from out of state that did. That's when we locked it down and made you become a member. But we've never had our students do anything remotely inappropriate with the online book. So I don't necessarily lock it down. This is what it looks like today. Um, but you can go back and see it in 2009 and see that original first version <coughs> Excuse me, that I showed. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Something in, in my throat here. So my answer for what do you want to use doesn't have to be Wikispace. It can be PB Works. It can be any variety of wiki. You can do it through a blog. You can do it through Google Sites. Um, that's your decision and what you want it to be. Um, some people are doing these kind of resources in Schoology or Edmodo or in some kind of MLS system. That's fine. Uh, I'm kind of against that for the main reason. I want everything to be open and on the web. Even my classroom, you know, my classroom website is out on the web. My professional, there aren't passwords, there's nothing to block people. I want everything publicly opened. Um, all my lesson plans are online. I don't, I don't hide anything. I want it all public out there for people to see. 
I think there's a little more transparency. As you get down, how do you give your students the ability to post in the digital textbook? I think we kind of responded to that. Um, all kids have access to post whenever they want. There are kids editing over the summer. There are kids adding things um, during the school year, during class. Um, there was a kid last year who I happen to remember specifically. We were doing more of a teacher-directed 10 or 15 minutes, like a mini lecture kind of thing, answering questions about what they were doing. And in the process, the kid was listening, and he went on the online link, and he was on my book, and he was editing it as I was talking. So he was making changes based on what was being said that particular day, um, which is great. You know, the kid's taking the initiative to do that. You know, how do you um, balance instructional time with allotting work on the digital textbook? I make them one and the same, okay? They are one and the same. It is not you are working on the textbook now by giving the kids their own blog space, they are constantly building material that can go on a blog space or that can go on the online book. So they're constantly creating material. Sometimes I see that when I look at their blog and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. How, you know, what are you doing here? And I bring out the point that this should be on the book. This is your legacy. This is a legacy piece of work you've done. Um, for other kids, they share it with others and all of a sudden the kids come to me and say, wow, this is awesome. You got to see it. Giving kids ownership of the learning and what's there is something um, I think is ultimately the most important thing you can do in my book, especially at a middle school, to get kids to buy into education and get them to love the idea of learning is to give them some control on what's happening. Um, I'm not a big guy on, like this post is going to give you a lot of links to a lot of things you might want to want to take a look at. You know, how do we change teaching and learning? You know, what about their online book movies? There's a lot of links that will help you get through that. Something I talk about, and this kid said it best, I think, if it's the right one I was thinking about, is, you know, yeah, he says it right here, I'm just inspired. I think that's what we want. I don't want to motivate kids. I do not want them to be motivated for my class to do a piece of work. I want them to be inspired to become something different, to change who they are. Um, and so... I think in these posts, you begin to see that kids feel that way because the work's different. We're giving them different things to do. We're allowing them to make choices. We're allowing them to find structure. Now we have Chromebooks, so the kids have access to literally everything you know on, in the world that's on the web. They can find it. They can access it. So the content that we're using to learn from is that what we're finding together, what we're, we're using in Digo, what we're building off of. So we're all kind of seeing similar resources, but it's how we interpret it and how we construct that and how we can best show what we're learning that becomes the more important piece for us. You talked a lot here about intrinsic motivation and grading and, and all of these things. I'm going to try to answer several of your questions um, in a row. First, um, I think at this point I've got a reputation in the district around me where parents kind of know what the kids are getting into before they get into it. <laughs> But with that said, um, my focus from day one is on intrinsic motivation. What are the questions that spark your interest? What are the things that, that you like to do? You know, if you're a Minecrafter, then you're going to build Minecrafting in my classroom. And we're going to find a way to make that connect to content. So we've got kids building huge Minecraft projects. If you are a drawer, you're going to do art projects built in. So we find their passion. What are they good at? What are they successful at doing? And then we allow them to use that inside the content we're teaching. I don't really care how they show their understanding of information. I just want them to understand it. With that said, I live in a testing world. I live in the same world that everybody else does who's in Common Core and mandated testings. So we do mastery. We give traditional quizzes. Kids can take them at their own pace. Some kids take them on Tuesday. Some kids take them on Thursday. But they are electronic. They're automatically graded. Um, they traditionally are middle or multiple choice. They're much like you would be used to seeing in any history classroom. But that's just the first step. you got to show mastery to move on. Then the kids are beginning to build amazing things um, and doing amazing things. Every kid builds something to be proud of by the end of the year, but not every kid builds something every week because they haven't mastered the content that they need to know based on what we're covering. Um, often on the projects, you're asking about rubrics. I'm an anti-rubric person, although you'll find rubrics on my website. You'll find rubrics for blogs. 
Um, I tend to give kids, like I mentioned at the beginning of the year, a very structured rubric that I want them to follow to build blogs. So they learn the process. They learn what makes a good blog. And then from there, I get rid of rubrics. Um, and I go to the only rubric I give my kids is your project must add value to history. That's it. I don't care what you do as long as you add value to history. And the kids distinguish what value to history is. Sorry about that noise. So that's one thing you might want to keep in mind. So the digital textbook is absolutely none of the kids' grade. They get no points, no credit for anything that's put on there in a grade book. They get only the intrinsic credit that whatever they created lives on in years to come. That is the draw. That is why kids want to do amazing work, because they want people to see their work. They want to share. If you look at the world we live in, uh, these kids are a sharing community. That's the world they see. They want to make YouTubes. They want to build things on Instagram. They want to share. So the intrinsic motivation comes from I want my work to be seen by thousands of people, if not thousands, at least hundreds next year. So there is a motivation there. Um, I really is, you know, I can't say it enough. I don't give any grades for that. What goes on the, uh, you know, the, the wiki space, which becomes our playground, is not graded. When a kid learns to ride a bike, you know, you don't grade them the first time. And I just don't, I don't want to limit what they're doing. I want to give them an open space. They've already shown mastery. They've already met the grade requirements. And with the amount of formative assessment I'm using on a daily basis in the classroom, I get a real sense of what they understand and don't understand before they take the mastery quiz. And I know what they're capable of doing once they start to build. Um, some kids are building thing links. Some kids are building stop motion animation. It's really up to them. But again, I don't provide grades or credit. Um, so I think that answers a lot of your, your questions. What they are ultimately doing is building on a daily basis in my room things that ultimately may be their legacy piece. And we kind of talk about it that way. What's your legacy piece? You know, are you a writer? Do you want to just edit? Do you want to change? Do you want to update? Are you an artist? Are you a builder? What are you? You know, we got kids building catapults and kids building working printing presses on their spare time, not because I assign it, but because they want to build it. We got kids making music videos because they have fun and they're sharing content knowledge with other kids. So as you look around the book, you'll see that. We see other kids interviewing experts all over the world using Google Hangouts or Skype to contact people all over the world that are experts on, you know, the, the Decameron, which I've read years ago and don't really understand. They do. And they will interview those people. Um, those are experiences for kids that will live well beyond who Mr. Holman was. So, you know, hopefully my legacy is, is I change them as people and history becomes ultimately important to them and understanding the world around them. You had a lot of questions about lesson plans. So I provide a lot of links in there with some lessons. I'm going to add a couple more in there because I, I think I will put my first like four weeks of what I do uh, together in a Google Doc much like this that just says day one, day two, kind of what we're doing. So you can see the progression of how we try to build trust and we build inquiry into every single day. Um, do I choose the projects? Nope, don't choose the projects at all. Um, the kids do that. Um, not everyone makes the cut, although everyone has the opportunity to make the cut. So in the end, I ask kids to stamp my wall. And if you look at some of the pictures, there's a huge wall that says, um, making positive digital footprints worth following. What's your legacy? And there's a foot stamp there that they can sign. And I never make the decision whether they, they stamp that wall. In that final evaluation that I showed you what one kid wrote, I simply ask them, do you feel you left positive digital footprints for others to follow? And if they say yes to that, which they make that decision, then after they're done, I say, hey, if you said yes, come on up and stamp because you are the one leaving the footprints. It's your legacy. It's not my decision to decide. Um, and I think that if you look at the book, there are special ed students work on there, there are extremely gifted students work on there, and there's your average kid on there. Um, and not all kids' work gets on there. Uh, that's not by my choice. That's either by theirs or by other students. Sometimes it's poetry quotes. It just depends on what, what, what they think is the most relevant that goes with the topic at hand. You know, I think we answered most of these the only last thing I'll kind of touch on, and then if there are more questions, I can always address those in a separate one. This is getting about 30 minutes, so that's plenty of time for you to sit and think about. And there's a lot of links on here I didn't address. Um, were there, what about the confidentiality acceptable use? I kind of talked about um, the confidentiality or, or 
that kind of thing. The kids are first names only. We um, acceptable use. We teach them. If you look at the book, it's almost all Creative Commons licensed, and they are linked back directly to where the image came from. So. In this picture, if I click it, it should take me back to Commons Wikimedia, and there's the original file showing the license that they were allowed to use. So that's pretty much done throughout the book. There are some pages that we don't really visit too much anymore because content changed where there might be pictures that are not done like that. Um, we didn't do that to begin with, and it became a problem. Rights of ownership. It depends on what you ask. Um, we have kids making movies where their the authenticity has been questioned by YouTube or other places. Usually we can argue fair use and we've had nothing um, pulled off the web because of fair use policy. We're not making money. We're not um, attempting to steal more than, you know, we're not taking their, their intellectual property. We're using less than the 10% required by law. We're using it for educational purposes. So pretty much everything has been able to be on the web. The other thing that I think is really important, um, I do get permission, like we mentioned, there is a parental sheet that goes home at the very beginning of the year. But this is the other thing that I find really interesting. In the end, um, there were some questions last year where we had a discussion with kids. We've been doing this for years. It's an interesting post, but this is what I wanted to point out. We make it very clear to the kids that they own all the content. It is your work, and you own that content. We make or we have kids sign and date this if they are willing to give us their work to put on the online book. Now, we don't put it on there. They do. But we want them to know it's theirs, that we will give you credit. It's not mine. I didn't build it. I didn't create it. I created a structure and let kids go from there. This is a piece I think needs to be done. Kids need to see this because otherwise we're not modeling the ultimate idea of digital footprints and legacy. We're actually trying to take credit for what kids created. You know, and I don't mean that to sound so harsh but the reality is I want them to know it's their work and when I go places I make it very clear when I present this is not mine I created a structure and this is all kids stuff kids like this and they feel empowered and they feel pride in what they did because they know when they leave it doesn't matter if they're a sophomore or senior in high school or if they're in college kids email me back and say geez I see my video still there it's still working um, the reaction from kids that move on is pretty impressive and they recognize it's their work um, we've got kids that have cited this for their college applications, some of their work in this book. Um, so it's pretty interesting. It's their work. It's not mine. So that's one thing I would leave you is to make sure that you give ownership back to the kids and they know it's theirs. There's some other presentations you might want to look at that we've done the first few weeks. Our first attempt at the online book, it kind of explained it, the wiki. Um, I think if you look at the questions you asked, Dallas, and I hope anybody else that wants to listen to me talk for 32 minutes or whatever it is, that I answered a lot of the questions, maybe didn't do it clearly. If you have other questions, you can always send them to me an email or uh, through Twitter, and I will try to respond. I would like to see more people do this. I know that was a question you had up here. You didn't see anybody else at the school doing that. That's probably accurate at this point. I think people are doing, um, they are collecting resources as a teacher created digital textbook. That is happening in this building by multiple people. I don't know that we're seeing the student created digital in this room or in this building. The other piece is I look around the country. I know there are teachers all over the country doing this that have contacted me. I've seen their sites. I probably should have put some of their links in there, and I may do that um, before I post this online. But if not, you can Google and you can find history teachers and Spanish teachers and, and language arts teachers where kids are creating the content that they're using. Um, it is a much more authentic educational experience in my mind because it is created by students. You know, another one you might want to look at is Math Train, you know, where it's mathtrain.com, which is out of California, where the kids are doing all tutorials on how to do the math. It's all kid created. So there are multiple examples of this happening around the country. But I would say, you know, in a nutshell, it's still a small percentage of educators that are doing this kind of work. Um, I encourage you to try to start to build your own database, whether it be you, to move away from books, or, and I don't mean books like novels but books like textbooks and to create your own content that kids can that might be more engaging that might be more uh, exciting for kids and give them more purpose and mastery so with that if there are any more questions get in touch with me hopefully this was helpful and uh, i'll take some water and hope i can talk later have a good day